As you all know that I, am, uh, I have served as a minister of a Baptist church back in India. And this has been my experience that in Baptist church, church it is really difficult to get people speaking. And so I'll try to be very patient to hear an answer from you. Today onwards, we are starting a new sermon series. And this series is based on the very book of the Bible that has, uh, that doesn't interest many people. You know, uh, back in India, when I asked people, how many of you have read this book? There were hardly any hands up in the air. And most of the time when we come to that book, we would say, okay, let me not read that. Any guesses what book I'm talking about? It's Revelation, see? That's, that's one of the book in Bible that we generally don't read. That we think, okay. Prophecy in Old Testament is fine, but Revelations, no, not my cup of tea. Because when we start reading Revelations, there are a lot of things in that book that we don't understand. And because that's the style of that book which doesn't uh, allow us to understand things as we go on to read them because there's there's a lot of descriptive things there, there's a lot of imagination that we need and a lot of things that are written in that book and one of the most surprising thing that I see that when we read the book of Revelation the book fills our heart with fear because it talks all about the end times. And interestingly, Hollywood has used this plot of end times again and again. You know, I, I, I really don't know how many times they have worked out a plot to end the world. And then there comes a superhero who saves the world. Every other movie is made on the world ending and the superhero coming, something happening and the world is saved. But then when we read it in the book of Revelations, our heart is filled with fear and we think, okay, that's not something good. I have to wake up tomorrow morning, I have to do my work, I have to get money, I have to come back home, eat my food, live a life and let me be happy. But talking about the end times, not a good thing. But interestingly, the book of Revelations talk about three reminds, of, reminds us of three important things. Now, this is not my main sermon. I'm just building uh, towards the sermon. So you would say three points, I would finish quickly, and then you would feel, oh, that's nice. He's a, such a good preacher. Let's give him again and again time. So, so let me just uh, warn you about it. There are three things that Book of Revelations reminds us all, and because of which our lives should not be filled with fear, but it should give us the hope that Book of Revelation talks about. The first and foremost that book reminds us is that God is in control. Now if we read the book of Revelations, it talks about the tribulations, it talks about uh, the seven seals, it talks about the seven trumpets, it talks about uh, the difficulties, the persecution the church uh, would face and all kind of things that we don't want to hear or don't want to talk about. But then this very book talks about, at the very end, about the new Jerusalem. This very book talks about we who are his believers would be in his kingdom, worshipping him in heaven above. And that's the thing that we need to know about this book, that this book talks about that God is in control, whatever situation may look like. Most of the time when we uh, see the disasters, most of the time when we see th things that happen around us, we tend up asking this question, oh, where is God in all this? But my friends, book of Revelation reminds us that God is in control. Second thing that this book reminds us is the victory of Christ is for sure. Now, the good versus bad is another plot that is again and again used by a lot of movies. The good versus bad. We had this uh, 
cartoon series or not not cartoon series a kids series that was made in india and the, it had two character shaktiman and kilwish now when i looked at that series that series talked about a stone a power giving stone which this evil man stole away from the good people and then the whole series was based on the fight between this shakti man the powerful good man and the evil man to take that stone and that reminded me of a very biblical thing because satan did exactly that thing satan took us away from god and now even today there is a struggle a fight between christ and satan to into in terms of controlling our lives and at the end christ is going to be victorious third and the most important thing which has a very important clause all will be saved is that right to say may there's something missing in that sentence okay all will be saved or all those who trust in christ will be saved and that's the important thing my friends these three things are reminded in the book of revelations so when we look at this quick purposes of book of revelation our life should be filled with hope our life should be filled with happiness our life should give us the boost to live a life that helps us to grow more and more closer to god now the very immediate purpose of this book of revelations was to encourage the seven churches that we would be mainly focusing on in days to come because these churches were facing persecution now if we uh, look at the general history in parallel with the biblical history we would know that around 90 AD a big persecution broke against followers of Christ and throughout the Roman empires Christians were persecuted because in early days when Christianity began they thought okay Christianity is just a sect of Judaism so they accepted them in a society they thought okay it is just a new thought that has come in so they are doing it together but then it started spreading and it was very very clear very soon that they are not part of jewish tradition or jewish faith but then they are something that is very very new because they found the messiah and that has caused a lot of social uh, issues and troubles and that's the reason mainly the persecution broke and when john wrote the book it was basically to encourage those churches and the surrounding areas so that they would be encouraged book of revelation is basically uh, classified under the title of prophecy but with the kind of material it has with the kind of stuff it has with the the style that has been followed in the book it is classified as apocalyptic book apocalyptic book basically is a kind of literature in bible which we also find in the book of daniel that talks of lot of images that talks of lot of descriptions but it gives out a message of hope now there's a big contrast when we talk about prophecy and apocalyptic literature prophecy is given towards sinners to ask them to repent apocalyptic literature is basically for righteous people to give them the hope that at the end things are going to be good just be there things will be good in your favor now our main focus in days to come would be on the first 3 chapters of the book i would rather say first 2 chapters of the book now the first two chapters contains seven letters to seven churches um 
in the Revelations. Now, if we read Revelations chapter 1, we see the list of seven churches. Uh, Genesis, uh, Revelations chapter 1, verse 11, it says, uh, which said, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And they were the main recipient of this book. But it was not just for them, but it was through them to uh, all those people, those who were facing persecution. And there are important things that we need to know before we start thinking about these letters. And that is what we are going to uh, talk about a bit today. Now, whenever there is an apple on the table, uh, just for an example, I know there is not there. And if I ask, there would be a lot of views about it. Right? Uh, there can be a lot of description. If, if I am there, I would say red. If Sheba is there, or if, uh, yeah, if Sheba is there, she would say, no, it's not exactly red. She would get into the big digest of colors, and she would get into the very exact name of that red color, red shade, and she would say, that is something, I don't know. She would know that. But for us, for me, it would be red. For these seven letters, various scholars have come up with a very, very different views. Some say that these seven letters talk about seven different regions around the world. And that's where this teaching are applicable to different, different regions. Well, this is also a good view. You know, it takes away a lot of load from us. Because then we'll have to find out in which region we lie and then ignore six letters and then say, Oh, this is for me. So other six, I don't need. Even other view is also much better like this, very comforting. It says the seven letters talk about different eras in the church history. So we are basically in the seventh letter now. So again, those six, we don't need. I mean, we are already done with that. So the last one is for us. Let's not read that. You know, that would make life so easier. But then the Bible, when it was written, it was for the immediate purpose and the purpose long, long after that. So, we, in this to come, would be focusing on all these seven letters. But then there are three important things that we get to learn from these letters. And my friends, I want you to be very uh, uh, attentive. I know it's, it might be a bit dull sermon because I cannot have uh, great funny one-liners like Pastor Warren does. Uh, I'm, I'm very poor in that. I'm trying to develop that too. But then there are three important things that I want all of us to take this morning from these letters. And then there's one big question that I would ask at the end of it. First and foremost, that we need to know as we are part of Greenford Baptist Church that God knows His church very, very well. Every letter, every seven letter, there's these words that are repeated again and again, where Christ says, I know. I know. I know. So Greenford Baptist Church, what we do in our church, things that we do in our church, things where we do as a part of a church, things as we do as one body of the church, God knows it all. And we spoke at length about God's presence last week. We said God is very much present and it was a really nice thing to uh, hear from uh, various people about how they experience that presence around their life. And Pastor Warren, again he went and described it very, very nicely. He knows every bit of our life. Because he is present there. You know, yesterday night I was talking to my daughter and I had a very interesting conversation with her. She was, uh, she was behind me from a long time to ask if I can take uh, the grape juice or wine and the bread. So 
it was a very uh, interesting uh, discussion with her and then I almost at the end of the discussion I asked Salome where do you think God lives and she looked at side and she said maybe here and I said Salome God lives in your heart she said is it oh that's not something right and he said no she was not ready to accept it because for her to understand that was uh, maybe a little bit difficult but then I told her God stays in your life stays in your heart and he knows what we do he knows what you think he knows where you go he sees you even when your parents are not there he sees you even when nobody is there church that's a very important reminder for us that god knows his church now what took my attention what takes my attention when i read this these letters is christ when we say god knows his church god also knew that this churches are undergoing a persecution okay now there is a question that would be coming up so get yourself ready with that but before that there's an ad commercial that i've intentionally got into my sermon god knows that this church was undergoing persecution and if i'm visiting someone who is suffering i will try to use all my good flowery sweet words to help that person comfort and make that person feel nice but if we read all these letters in fact five sorry in fact five of them has two important sections first thing god says oh you're good and then says but this 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 is not right in you but that's what does that make you know god condemned them another intentional condemnation word that i've used why i'm using this why i wanted to talk about this is we are really having a good time in our house groups or the bible study groups that we have you know last week i was speaking to someone and uh, one of the house groups is already talking about the dna of jesus now if you want to know more about it get in touch with people and ask what the whole discussion is all about it's an interesting discussion but the word condemnation that i am talking about uh, last week when we met as a bible study group uh, which is led by andy in the church right now we were talking about the book of galatians and we there is a incidents that paul talks about where he corrected peter for something that he was not right and when he was talking about it you know we 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 came to a question that look at this both were the key leaders of the new testament church in fact peter was the big boss first because paul was no in the scenario and then suddenly paul came from behind him and then he corrects the big boss and he is not only correcting it and keeping it under the uh, you know hidden somewhere but he is writing that so that people who ever read the galatians even till today would know that paul did something to correct the peter and then then we said that it is not insulting peter but it is the maturity that we get when we grow in god okay now this is an ad commercial so please please get into bible study groups we are having interesting time i know this week i suppose it's a last week and then after break we start so get into get in touch with people those who are going to bible study group and be a part of one god would certainly bless you for that well now the first question i'll try to be i'll try to control my heart by not jumping off and moving away with the answers that i have why do we think that christ when addressed to this church the pers- the church that is already suffering under persecution to these churches why do you think that god is condemning them or talking about the things that are not right in them a very simple question you know i'm not like pastor david he is a very great scholar of bible i'm not like him so fine uh why do you think hands yeah good i'm happy <laughs> so that they can grow so that they can grow good any hands if you move little hand i'll jump towards you 
Well, they're obviously on the wrong course or some, some error in, in the way they were worshipping. So God corrected them, put them back on the right path. God corrected them from the uh, wrong path that they were on and God wanted to make sure that they're back on the right track. Okay. I think it's about um, discipline and correction. God loves us. He said in the book of um, Psalm 23 that your rod and your staff will comfort me. <coughs> The rod to whip us to shape when we derail, and the staff to love us, you know, that sort of, to envelop us with love and treat, treat us like princes and princesses. So it's about loving and also discipline, if you get what I mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So God wanted to discipline them even when he was, I mean, even though he was in love with them or even though when he loves them, he wanted to make sure that they are disciplined. But then why do persecuted churches, they were already suffering. They must be already saying, oh God, why this, all these things on us? Any hands here? Uh, I'll say that it is for a purpose because if these people are out of the persecution, for instance, and still continue in the way they do things, the church will suffer internal persecution. I mean, internal problem that may not be from the world. That apart from what they are suffering in the hands of the unbelievers, they also have their own issue. But even in human um, understanding, it's very, very difficult. You see someone suffering, all the person wants is comfort, comfort. The person don't want you to tell him or her where he or she is not getting it right. So, but God is not human, and I think if we are to be in the nature of God, we should also accept rebuke as we accept comfort. Praise the Lord. Goodness. I think they've fallen from their love for Christ, and God wants to correct them and bring them back for that love. They, they were lukewarm. This is a part of my next sermon, so I'm going to ignore the answer now. <laughs> but then, that's, that's right. They, were, they fall down from their first level, and God wanted to make sure that they are back on the track. Maybe because God's job in life is not just to feed us lovely words when we feel down. Um, I feel like he doesn't just tell us what we want to hear at the time because he knows that's only a temporary solution. But by helping people and encouraging them to change from the course they're on, that's something that will fix them in the long run. So God wanted to make sure that we are strong in the long run. Because his love for us as a father and he doesn't want us to go uh, in the wrong path. Because he loves us as a father and he doesn't want it to go in the wrong path. I know for myself as a human being, sometimes I've been going along doing something and it's fine, you know. I'm just so used to doing it and then somebody says, why are you doing that? And then it makes me question why I'm doing it. And actually it's wrong. So if I'm doing something wrong, how can I be working with a God that is sovereign and judge also? He wants us to be right with him so that we can make it, so we can make it there. So God wants us to sustain in the situation, whatever situation we are, and uh, reach where he wants us to be. There is one important thing that I always told Sheba as we were serving uh, back in India. If there are no issues in the church, okay, that means we are not doing it right. Naturally. Because if we are not praising God, if we are not focused on what we are supposed to do, Satan is happy about us. He would make sure that we continue in the same way, relaxed, comfortable, nice, cozy. Because anyway we are there, but we are not there. So when God is telling them, look at these factors, this you need to change, God is only telling them, as we said, to correct them, to make them right, to make, bring them on the path. Because God wanted to, God wanted make, uh, sorry, God wanted them to stand strong. Because if they continue in the same path, they would weaken and they would lose. Or they would give away the hope that Christ had for them. God loves us, and that's a nice thing to know, but love comes with discipline. 
and discipline is difficult to accept. Difficult to listen to. But it is easier for kids to listen uh, from their parents if they are like Salome, small kids, younger kids. But then when they grow up, which I know my situation would be after some years from now, I might get and reply. Oh, you don't tell me that what to do. If I gather all my courage and go to someone saying, hey, my friend, I don't think so, that's right. Ah, <laughs> that's a bad position for me. I might not see that person smiling at me for a long, long time. Till the time something else happens and then we become close again. But then the, the reason why God is correcting the church is to make sure that they are strong enough to face the persecution that they are facing. That means there were things that they were doing right, which disturbed Satan. But then there were also things that would weaken them. In long course of time, they might give up and they might go away from what they are doing. So my friends, church, it is important to know that we, what we do, when we do, how we do, is all known to God. And when God disciplines us, it is for a reason so that we can stand firm, to come back on the track, to be who we are meant to be, so that we continue to do what we are supposed to do. Second important thing, every action has equal and opposite reaction. And now don't ask me who was that. Newton, see I'm a very poor student, science student. That's the reason I chose commerce when I went after my schooling. And that's the principle of God. If we continue to love God, God would help us, God would bless us, God would strengthen us, but if we choose to do which is not right, which surprisingly is very comfortable thing in life. Now, I don't know how many of you have observed this. Negative things are very, very comfortable. Now, for me, if you have seen me 10 years from now, uh, 10 years ago, I was a very thin person. You know, when I used to wear T-shirts, people used to call me, oh, see, that's a T-shirt hanging on the t t uh, hanger and coming. And then I was, I was uh, serving in a rural college there, in a Bible college, and then I was blessed, and I got a lot of weight there. And that was almost about 10 years now. And for last 10 years, I'm trying to work out on the weight, get back into the shape, but that's not working. And that's something very true with the sin as well. We are very comfortable, we, we feel very cozy, we feel very nice when we do things that are not right. But when we try to come out of it, we really struggle and we really take long, long time to come out of it than the time we took to get into it. So it is important to watch our step because everything that we do in our life, everything we do as a church in our life, everything we do as an individual in our life will have equal and opposite reaction. Now interestingly, in uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 12, now there's a concept of lampstands that is brought in. It says, I turn around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now lampstands were a very, very crucial part of Jewish worship. The worship uh, that was told by God when he asked them to build the tabernacle and Exodus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. It was a very important part of the temple era because the temporary structure of tabernacle was built into the strongest structure of temple. 
and the architectural style or the division was still there. So the lampstand was part of the most holy place. Now if you know uh, in general the uh, structure of tabernacle or uh, the temple, in the Jewish temple or the Jerusalem temple that we talk about in Bible, it had a general place, it had the holy place, and it had the most holy place. Where everybody could not go. Even high priest could not just go there. There were a lot of things that they had to do. And lampstand was the only source of light in that most holy place. Because that most holy place was covered by curtains. And if you remember when Christ died on the cross, there is a reference of curtain torn apart in the between. And that's where... Uh, there was no more distinction of between holy, most holy, and the general place because God resides everywhere. And this lampstand was supposed to provide light in that region. Now, in the most holy place, there was a tabernacle. There was this lampstand, and that's where it was said that the presence of God is. And now where is the presence of God? I told, I had a discussion with Salom yesterday in our hearts. Okay. So, lampstand played a very important role in, in the worship of Israel's. So, if we are to read and take that reference, it is a very simple, simple to understand that when God talks about, Christ talks about the lampstand, he simply means that the basic work that you're supposed to do is to give light to the world that is in the darkness. And the imaginary that is, uh, or the, the thing that John saw was he was standing there in the midst of lampstand. And this lampstand, you know, when we read these letters, he, would, he said to one of the churches, if you don't do what is right, I'll remove your lampstand. So if we as a church don't do what we're supposed to do, if we as a church don't glorify God through our lives, if we as an individual, because individual forms a church, I'm not talking about the building, but the fellowship of believers, when we do it, the church family also would face the judgment of God. And that is a reminder that these letters give us. Third, and the most important thing, is the ball is on our court. You know, I am a very poor or a very new to religion of football, so I really don't understand much. But then I understand that much that if a ball is given to you, you need to make sure that you, your team has the ball so that it can ultimately given, uh, send to the goal post and get a goal. So God, in every letter, has given ball to, our, to us and to make sure that we make right use of it. In every letter, the letter concludes with a sentence, those who have ears should listen. Now God made us. He knows that we have ears. Friends, God is seeking our willingness to correct ourselves and to make sure that we do what is right for us. Now very soon I'm going to ask a last question and then I'm going to conclude my sermon. To these churches when God wrote the letter, his only, uh, the only purpose of these letters was to encourage them and strengthen them by telling what wrong they were doing. Even when they were facing the persecution. Few of the churches could not correct themselves and soon became part of the history. Few of the churches continued to grow strong and then they were there for some time in the history. Now my question to GBC this morning is, what about us? 
what are we where do we stand if christ chose to write a letter today to us like he chose to write to seven of these churches and i really don't know how many would answer this what letter do you think we would receive what would christ say to us in his format he would say i know dot 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 but i know or won't there won't there be a section of but that would be nice right if there's no but and it's only first section of commending us saying oh you're good oh you're so nice oh you continue to meet every sunday oh you continue to sing good songs oh you go to you have a good bible study oh you good do good you do good in this oh you do good in that i i really didn't expect an answer for this because it's difficult to say but i know this is what is not right in you friends as we continue to look forward in this topic of what about us i request all of us to think about us as an individual think about us as a church family and think what letter we would receive it christ has to sit down and write a letter to us let's pray Lord, we come at your feet at this time of the morning. We thank you for this time that you have given to us. Lord, we know the very truth that you love us. We know the very truth that you live in our lives. That your very presence is a part of our lives, Lord. That you know us. That you want to correct us. That you want to make sure that we are part of your kingdom. We are part of with you in your kingdom lord so that we would worship you with the angels lord and this hope that you have given to us in the book of revelations lord is so much important for us in our spiritual life it is so much important for us as we continue to in, uh, continue to live in this world lord lord and we pray that this hope that you have given to us lord help us to read the book of revelations and not be filled with the fear but lord see the hope that you have given for us lord and live our lives in a way that would tell the world about the hope that we have lord that we don't need any other superhero because we have christ we have god who is in control of all the situations even though situations might look chaotic even though situations might look that they are out of control but you are still in control god Lord and as a church help us to see things that are strengths and moreover Lord help us to see things that are our weakness so that we can correct them and become a strong body of Christ that would face any situation that comes around Lord We thank you and praise you Lord. In Jesus precious name we pray. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.